Please have a seat. Mayor, I looked up your name. <laughs> it's a little easier to pronounce than yours. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to call you Ted, Ted if that's all right. <laughs> but I understand there's a lot of Polish people around here. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I'm not one of them. <laughs> I know, I saw your name. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a hard time with it. Well, thank you for coming and talking with us today. Um, we received your resume. And of course, that doesn't give us a complete picture of who you are and all the qualifications that you would bring to this position. Um, so what we're going to do is going to go through a set of questions that we ask all our candidates. And it should take a, probably around an hour, a little over an hour. And I will start off, and then each one of the council members will have an opportunity to follow up with their questions, and then they will ask their own after a few. Very good. Okay. Um, so if you could, can you just give us a brief summary of your experience and then tell us why you applied to Manistee and how you think your style and expertise will be the right fit for us. Well, I'll give you a little background. I probably did a little bit different than most people. I started off in the uh, private sector, worked for uh, companies such as Sherwin-Williams in Cleveland and AT&T, and I worked in various marketing, sales, management positions. Then, oh... When my kids started getting a little older, I decided to run for council in the city of Eastlake and uh, won for council. And then we had sort of a mismanaged government, uh, sort of a semi-corrupt individual as mayor. So I decided to run for mayor and it really shows our system works because out of nowhere, uh, people like my financial background and the fact that I spent a good year on council and I was elected mayor of Eastlake, a full-time mayor and served the people for nine years. And then they decided to go another direction. Uh, the, uh, uh, my opponent ran a good campaign with the time for a change. So the people said, okay, yeah, Ted's been there 10 years, let's do something else. So I decided, you know, I'm a good manager of um, a city. So I looked around for a city manager's position and found one in the Upper Peninsula, Menominee, Michigan, very nice, town, about 9,000, 8,900 people, and I've served as um, city manager for over a year and a half now, since February of 2014. So I have about 10 years of, a little over 10 years, of city manager experience. Because as a mayor, full-time mayor in East Lake, I was, I was the city manager. I did exactly what a city manager does, except I was called a strong mayor. Okay. Uh, why Manistee? Well, first of all, Manistee is the size of community that I'm very comfortable with. I like this nine to 12,000 population. Uh, you have about, what, maybe four or five miles of city. It's in a nice um, suburban type atmosphere where you're just not by yourself. The, the, the only negative I have with Menominee is it's by itself. And I was telling um, Kathy, right? That, uh, and Cindy, that uh, my wife is one of those who likes her Kohl's and her Targets and her uh, shopping malls, and we have a Walmart and a Kmart, doesn't suit her style. <laughs> and uh, I'm a golfer, okay, and uh, uh, a lot of hunting and fishing up there. So, very nice community, uh, I like it up there, it's just a little too cold and a little too rural for us. So I looked at Manistee when it came on board the uh, website and I said that's that's a nice community. I did a little research on the internet, found the population, found the size, found the history and I said I could fit in real nice there. So uh, I have a good financial background. You'll find I'm a good manager of people and I know you have about 55 to 60 employees here which is very nice, right? The size that I like. So that's my story. Okay. Um... Can you tell us a little bit about, more about you as an individual? You did tell us a little bit um, kind of what occupies yourself outside of work. Can you give us a little bit more idea of who you are and what kind of things you like to do outside of work? Sure. I've, uh, I've been married for 37, 37 years. And we have four grown children. They're all kind of spread out. There's one in New York State in Rochester, one in Chicago, one in Bowling Green, and one still in uh, Eastlake. Uh, I... Throughout my life, took care of my kids and coached them in every sport you could think of. Uh, we did baseball, soccer, uh, everything but football. My wife was kind of against football, so we didn't do football. Basketball, girls' softball. And then um, 
uh, with my positions that I had, because I was in a lot of sales and marketing positions, I had a lot of nice free time. As long as I made my goals, which I always did, I'm very goal oriented. I'm very much uh, given a job to do and I do it. And I was able to use that flexibility to coach them. And they all turned out to be very good um, adults. They are very good adults. And they, two of them have married. Two of them are still single. Uh, I like to play golf. I, I like to get involved in community activities. I, I did a lot in East Lake. If, if you went and talked to people in East Lake, I'm all over the place. Uh, I did a lot of activities in our church, Catholic church. Uh, ran a golf outing for them every year. Was a member of several clubs. Helped with the festivals. Um, United Way volunteer. I did local government uh, in Lake County, which is um, the biggest county in that area. I did local government collecting and uh, work with United Way. Uh, I had a very good relationship and very fond of my heart a company or an uh, independent uh, nonprofit called company called New Avenues to Independence. In East Lake, they built a facility that recycled um, styrofoam, but they employed handicapped individuals. And they employed 10 to 12 of them, and they had facilities around Ohio. So I became very involved in fundraising and working with them to uh, help. They had the homes where um, they would buy a home, put a person in charge of the home, and have four or five handicapped individuals, but able to still live on their own with help. So we did a lot of that. You're going to find a very community-oriented. As I said, I like to play golf. Uh, I like to ride a bike. My wife and I like to walk a lot, stay in shape. Um, when I play golf, I always walk, unless I have to take a cart in a golf outing or something. Um, and I like people. I mean, I, I found throughout my life in sales, marketing with residents, I, I get along good with the, not only residents, but I get along good with business people. So that's it. That's me. <laughs> okay. Um. Can you tell us, looking back at your career, um, about two of the most things of your accomplishments that you take the most pride in? Well, number one has to be elected the mayor. Because um, I, I still remember the day when I went home. I was working for Key Bank, which is a big regional bank. I was a branch manager. Very happy in that position. Made good money. Made my bonuses. Was able to spend time with the kids and my wife, and, and all of a sudden I said, okay, I'm gonna run for council. I ran for council and won, beat, a, beat an incumbent. And then the city went into bankruptcy. Um, what's called fiscal emergency in Ohio. The city was $3 million in debt in the uh, general fund and had a $50 million debt with a single A ballpark that the previous mayor before me built as a monument to himself. So, I went home after the mayor left town. He declared that he was um, uh, disabled and went on Ohio disability and left town. And there were five or six people running for mayor. And I looked at all the five candidates and said, I can't, I, I gotta do something, I can't. None of them I would vote for. So I went home and asked my wife and kids, what do you want me to do and run for mayor? And in three months I was elected mayor of East Lake. So I'm very proud of that. And it shows that our system works. It shows that as flawed as the people may say that our government is and all the different things we have that people don't like, it works. Because here's an individual that uh, went from being a private citizen to mayor of a pretty good sized city. So that's one. Uh, another one I would have to say is just bringing up the four kids properly. They're all good children, they're, they're adults now. They're all good adults. They all have good jobs. They're, three of them have master's degrees. One of them has a bachelor's degree. So I'm very proud of that. Staying married 37 years in this day and age is, is pretty good. So. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's all the questions. I have any other follow-up questions? Ms. Member Cody. Good afternoon. Um, have you ever been terminated, asked to resign, or resigned before termination action? action? Tell us about it. No. Um, up in Menominee, I think if you look on the internet, and I'll be very unfront and honest with you, there's a couple of council people that from day one didn't like me. 
just two. There's nine council people, seven uh, have always been on my side, but I think if you look in the internet, you're probably going to see a couple of headlines that say councilman asked for city manager's um, resignation, whatever. Uh, but they never had votes. It was always just two of them wanting to get headlines. And the newspaper there is very much biased towards a couple of people and a couple of groups up there. So the answer to your question is no, I have not been terminated. And now, why are you thinking about leaving your current position? Well, it is very rural up there, as I said in my opening remarks. And the, um, it's cold. I, I won't kid you. It's, I mean, we had weeks up there that was minus 14 to minus 18 degrees and didn't go above zero for weeks. So mm -hmm. our pipes froze. We had let it run programs. We had everything to deal with the cold. Um, it, it's very much too rural for us, and, and it's very much too cold, and it is very far from our family. I mean, my kids are all in, within about three and a half, four hours of Ohio, and it's, it's really hard to get to see them during holidays, and especially trying to drive back. So it's a combination of, uh, I like the opportunity here. I, I, I want to stress that because it's not just, okay, pick up a job and go somewhere. I like the city. I like what I've seen here. And I want to move uh, away from that cold rural area. Okay, well, if you were offered a position for ESD, how would you stay in, in touch with the community, with the residents, and the business community? Okay. Well, with the residents, I've always gotten along well by having an open door policy. And, and, and people will say they have an open door policy, but I really do. My office door is open. I can't tell you the countless times residents will just come in and say, can I have a word with you? Sure, come on in, let's hear what you have to say. And I think then word spreads around the community that Ted's approachable, you can talk to him, even if sometimes I have to tell him no, I tell him no in a nice way where they understand that I just, I can't help you with this one. Um, as far as the community, uh, as I said, I'm a golfer. I, I think. Over the years, I've met so many people playing golf on the golf course. Uh, I go to church regularly, so I usually end up being good friends with people in the local Catholic church and uh, get to know the people through there. Chamber of Commerce. I belong to the, um, or went to meeting, I didn't belong to, the Kiwanis Club. Uh, now, that's as far as people, that's as far as uh, uh, groups. As far as businesses, the best way to meet a business is go out and meet them. So I can tell you the major businesses in Menominee, I have visited with their CEOs or presidents. I have met with them. I have discussed, can the city do anything for you? Is there any of your needs? Are you going to expand? Can we help you with that? So I think the best way to meet um, the businesses is to actually go out and meet them. Okay. I was looking at your resume here, and you got a I got bored by one. He said, you brought the city out of uh, state of financial probation to achieve a balanced budget in all nine years as mayor. Tell us a little bit about that. What, well, there, what, what was the problem and how did you achieve it? Well, what happened was in the, in the good times, the previous mayor before me overspent. And let, let's just say the budget, back then we had a budget of, um, when I was mayor of East Lake, our budget was 11, 12 million and a total budget of about uh, 28 million when you take in all the other funds. Well, he overspent and what happened was as the economy um, closed in, as the economy got worse, instead of taking in 12 million dollars, they only took in 11 million dollars and he never adjusted the spending. Uh, the same level of staffing was there, the same amount of capital improvement spending was there, and then all of a sudden at the end of, um, it was 2003, 2002, uh, when the year-end report came out, lo and behold, the general fund was $3 million in debt. At that point, the state of Ohio came in and put the city under fiscal emergency, uh, sort of like what's in Michigan where they talk about, where you talk about receivership, like Flint and some of the other cities I've seen under receivership, Detroit, not as big as Detroit. Um, so the state came in and they made us, the first thing I did as mayor is come up with a what they call a recovery plan. 
how are you going to get out of the three million dollars in debt? And how are you going to attack the fifty million million dollars in debt on the stadium? So we came up with a recovery plan. It involved um, painful cuts. We even had to cut uh, police and firemen. And we got the budget down to where we were able to pay, uh, not only succeed as running the city, but then take some of the surplus and pay it towards the debt. And in two and a half years, we came out of fiscal emergency. And we were recognized as one of the cities that uh, came out of fiscal emergency the quickest. Two and a half years is really quick to come out of fiscal emergency. But we cut where we had to cut. Uh, there, and I don't want you to think that I'm the type of person who's just going to have no feeling. It was tough. We tried to get people to take uh, early retirement, those that were eligible for Ohio retirement, those that could get other jobs. We helped them get other jobs. But in the end, we had to lay off people, and it was tough to do. But it was either lay off the people or never come out of fiscal emergency. Now, Did you maintain services while you were doing it? Oh, yes. Sure. Or, or a reduction in service or what? There was no reduction in service. Several years later in the police department, we had to make additional cuts, and then we stopped things like um, when people called to have their locks open with their door, um, car, and then we had uh, residents come to the police department to do police reports for minor things as opposed to a policeman going out. But no, we were able to keep our services, yes. Snow removal was a little longer, leaf pickup was a little longer, um, but we maintained services. The city was overstaffed. I mean, uh, truthfully, he employed a lot of his friends, the guy before me, and gave them jobs in the service department, and, and they were overstaffed. So I'll give you an example. In the building department, what, what the previous mayor used to do is if, if you were a councilman and worked with him for about four, four or eight years, in Ohio you could retire after ten years, he would say, work with me, and then for the last two years, I'll give you a job in the city. And that way you'll have your two years in to make ten years and get retirement. So he appointed an individual in the building department and gave him a title. And the guy did nothing all day but shuffle paper. He didn't have any licenses, any um, background to work in the building department. So there were people around City Hall and in the service department that we found that were really not necessary. Now, for the stadium debt, that was a tougher one. It was a long-term debt. Uh, what we did is we took a look at it, and we first went and collected any money that was due the city. We were promised money from the federal government that was left in limbo, so we worked with our congressman, and we got that uh, money from the federal government. We were promised money from the county. We got that money. And then personally, I worked with our finance director and we sold the naming rights for $5 million over a period of 15 years. Now, when I left in December of uh, 2013, this is a matter of public record, the debt was $19.5 $19 million. We also sold a cell tower. Pretty creative way to do something. We had a cell tower that a company was paying us $20,000 a year. And we got an offer of a half a million dollars for another company to come in, buy that cell tower, because they were going to add other phone companies to it. We took that $500,000, paid it directly into the debt that we had, and then we were able to save another $500,000 in interest. So we knocked off a million dollars with that one transaction. Um, the finance director and myself both came from the banking industry and we refinanced every one of our bonds and right now in East Lake the bonds are percent and a half, maybe two percent the, the highest. So when the, when the interest rates started dropping we started refinancing. So we saved a lot of money by taking five and six percent uh, debt and making it into one and a half, two percent. And again, this is all a matter of public. <coughs> so it was a combination, Mr. Councilman, of fiscal responsibility, taking a look at where we could cut and save, and then using some creative ways. Getting the naming rights was big. Uh, the naming rights sat there. The stadium was open for three years without a name. And we went out and sold the naming rights. By the way, I see your signs out there. 
<laughs> you like them? Now that I heard your name. Well, I, you, may, you may not believe this, but I'm not saying this to butter up to you, but when I ran, my signs were black and yellow. So, and, and two, on a side note, I was kidding the um, service director when he took me around. Very nice individual. I don't know whether this is ironic or it's a good omen or what. I'm hoping it's a good omen, but you have a village of Eastlake right near here. And I looked at that and I said, there's a sign there that says East Lake. So. Thank you. Any follow-up questions? Councilmember Ted, I have a few questions. When we call on individuals you've worked with over the past years, what are they going to tell us about you? Well, the first thing they're going to tell you is you're not going to find a more honest individual. I have integrity and honesty. And, and even now when I go visit East Lake, they'll, they'll tell you that. I mean, it's, they'll tell you I'm a hard worker and I know my finances. Uh, I know financial matters. I'm very good with finances. I'm very good with um, uh, structure and, and running a good, well-managed city. So I think that's what they would tell you. Dad, what would your first three months look like in Manistee? You were, uh, chosen. Well, you know what? I, I thought about that. I, I, I can give you a fresh perspective. I've, I come from the outside. I wasn't born here. I wasn't raised here. So I can truly come in here and take a look at the city and say, you know, what's going on here from a, from a non-biased point of view. Just, just look at it fresh. And, and as I did in Menominee, what I would do is for the first three months just kind of observe uh, watch what's going on, meet as many people as I can, absolutely touch base with every department head, police, fire, uh, service department, uh, treasurer, what, um, and, and make sure they get to know me and get to know my style. But for the first three months, I think I would just, I would watch, I would observe, I would make notes to myself what we maybe could, could uh, take a look at changing, what's working very well, leave it alone not make any drastic changes for the first three months. Just kind of get a feel of things. Okay. Next question is a two-part question. It's uh, kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, what do you see in Manistee that sets us apart from other places you've worked? And what particular skills, talents, or experiences do you have um, that would make your tender here successful? Well, I, I, there's no doubt what sets Manistee apart is the ability to have the water resources. I mean, you have Lake Manistee, and you have uh, Lake Michigan, and you have everything that goes along with that, all the boating, all the fishing, all the tourists, all the beaches and all that. So I think uh, if I were to market Manistee, I would market the, uh, the water and the beaches and the family lifestyle and the uh, historic aspect of the city. Now, what was the second part of your question? What skills do I have to manage that? Um, again, I'm a good organizer. I can work very well with finances, keep a balanced budget, um, use the money we have for the benefit of the people. Um, I think part of our job as government, or a lot of part of our job as government, where government, local government is very um, labor intensive. I mean, we can't do a lot. We can do some with machinery, but there's not a whole lot you can do with technology because you still need policemen, firemen, you need service workers to fix the streets, plow the streets, so we gotta make sure that the money in the budget is directed towards those services for the people. I am very much, um, and people would also tell you this in East Lake, I'm very much into providing services for the community. That's our job. They pay us tax dollars with their real estate taxes, we should funnel that back into the community. So, I have good organizational skills, I have good financial skills. Any other follow-up questions? I have one. Um, you talked about that you were in the private industry and then you, you became mayor. And I also work in financial and the private. And I found government to be quite different than the private. How did you learn the necessary skills to achieve to be a city manager coming from the private sector? You're right. Uh, Public sector is not like the public, uh, fi uh, private sector. In private sector, I mean, you have um, uh, 
first of all, the biggest thing I had to overcome was the ability to understand that in government it takes a long time to do something. Because in a private sector, you could meet with your managers, you could meet with the sales reps, and you can get things done right away. In government, there's committees, there's studies, there's tabling, there's let's study this more. It doesn't work very fast. So it, it did take me a while to understand you got to work with the process, you got to do the committees, you got to do the studies, you got to do fit it into the budget, and then do it. So it, it was a good transition. But remember, I did that 10 years ago. So now I, I know a lot better. Uh, you learn from experience. Okay? Now, the transition from mayor to city manager wasn't very difficult because it was all the same things. It was still managing a city, except I didn't have to run anymore. So I didn't have to campaign and I could stay pretty neutral uh, as far as political, you know, whether you're Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. You're the city manager. So it was a transition and I've learned from it. And I've learned how to adjust to it. And I've done very well over those last 10 years. Can you tell me how you developed the necessary skills to become a city manager? <coughs> with experience, with um, patience, um, with learning to work within the system, I guess. I mean, the, the same skills I possessed as a mayor, I transitioned into a city manager because all the duties are the same. You still have responsibility for city services, for operations of the various departments, except now you're called a city manager, you're not called a mayor. So, right. does, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. okay. Councilmember Goodspeed. From, from what you learned about us, what do you think our two biggest challenges will be in the next three years? How would you tackle them and what process would you follow? Like most cities in Michigan, and you probably throw Ohio and Wisconsin in there too, um, the financials are very tight. Uh, there's not a whole lot of money to work with anymore. Uh, people don't want to hear that we need more money in government. They want to hear that you balance your budget, that you use what we give you wisely. And at my home budget, the people would tell me, I have a budget at home I have to follow. I can't overspend, so you guys don't overspend either. So probably top five priorities, use the money you have wisely. Uh, try to find ways to save money. Try to find some grants that are out there. Not a lot of grants out there, but there's some. Um, and, and, and give the people the services they look for. Maybe they'll, they'll understand it. Even though it's tight, maybe sometime down the road you might need a little bit more money and they'll give it to you. That's one. I think uh, one thing I've learned in Michigan is the roads are not in great shape. And I think um, there are some challenges here with finding money to fix roads. Um, to repave, to do the crushing shapes, whatever uh, the process is here. And I think you have some challenges on your roads too. So financials, roads. Okay, quick follow up. Ed, you toured our community, correct? Yeah, Jeff was a very nice tour guide, by the way. Give him a raise. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you assume that you would be the next city manager. What were already on your to-do lists? Do you have any, you grab something and said, yeah, this needs to be addressed? Well, when Jeff and I were talking, I know you're going through a negotiations with a, a village to take over their sewer. Um, I think it's water, it's just, maybe it's just sewer. But we talked about that a little bit, so I think that'd be a priority to do, get that deal done. Um, I know Jeff has some ideas in the, in the DPW, some really good ideas, what to do to work with him on changing maybe some processes down the road. I think he's a very forward thinker. I would look forward to working with him. And he's an engineer too, so that's a plus. Um, to do this, to do this, just, just I, I think right up front, just to learn a little bit more about the city and its people and its businesses. I, I've learned that you have a big paper mill here, you have Morton Salt, you have some other businesses that are doing well, but you also have some uh, uh, areas of opportunity. You got a big industrial park that, that was very impressive and I asked Jeff and, and he told me that's owned by the city so if there was an opportunity to bring in a business you've got land already with the infrastructure to offer to them. 
So that's a big plus. Um, I'll, I'll segue into this. I'm very good at economic development. I'm very good with working with businesses. And, and here's the thing with economic development is General Motors doesn't pick up the phone and say, City of Manistee, I want to build a regional headquarters in your city. They don't do that. What, what, what you have to do with economic development is when you get a lead from somebody, you follow it through right till the end. That's where my sales ability comes in. If someone wants to come to your community, you work with them until either they tell you yes or no. And then um, a, a lot of times the challenges with smaller businesses are not that, we what can you give us? It's more like, well, can you help me with your building department regulations? Can you help me with your your uh, permits and fees and all that. So the easier you can make it for a smaller business to come into the community, the better, okay? With a bigger business, you gotta market the community and I, I would assure you this, if I got a lead that somebody wants to come in here, build a plant, build an office building out in that industrial park, I'd follow it through right till the end. Yes or no, I have an answer. What is your most difficult ethical challenge you've faced as a municipal executive? Tell us how you would handle it and what you've done differently, if anything. One that I faced or would face? That you have faced. Now, we had a difficult situation in East Lake. I had an employee in the building department who, who thought he was the world's greatest gift to women. And uh, he was um, uh, sexually harassing with words and pictures and things. So uh, when I found out about it from the two ladies working in the building department, the first thing I did is sat down with our finance director right next to me and we asked them if anything happened at work and the answer was no. Borderline yes, but no. Called the police chief, had him do an investigation. And then I worked with our, we, on, on situations that difficult I did have a, a human resource consultant, labor attorney that we worked with, and we gave this employee a last chance agreement. Um, the only reason I didn't fire him right off the bat was because nothing happened at work. It happened outside of work, bordering to coming to work. Um, and then the guy went on TV, and just, it hit the TV, and you know, what's going on at East Lake? And um, there was another situation that came about and we used that situation to terminate him. And that whole process took about two and a half weeks. We, what I did is I acted the way you're supposed to act as the chief executive. I investigated, I found out both sides of the story and when we found out it was wrong and violations, we terminated the employee. That was the most difficult one I had to deal with. We had other things where we had to terminate a um, fire department person who was high on um, prescription drugs, but that wasn't as difficult because the fire, even the firemen knew he was a bad apple, so. Okay. What is the most important skill a manager can have when it comes to manager council relationship success? Tell us about the time that you had to rely on that talent to build or improve relations. Well, I think it's a combination of listening skills and communicating skills. I think the job as a city manager is, I, I, you would find I probably would give you more information than less information. Uh, I would rather have you know more about a situation than less of a situation. So communicate. Um, nowadays, a lot of communication is done by email. So, I mean, there's probably a lot of emails going back and forth. Um, I do have an open door policy in, in, in Menominee, the mayor and councilman call me 7.30, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night when I'm watching a football game, so that's fine. Uh, as long as we talk, that's fine. Um, so communication, listening skills. We're going through one now, and, and, and when I go back tomorrow or Wednesday, we're going to have a special council meeting. Um, and I've been communicating very well, letting them know what's going on. But our assessor, uh, we terminated earlier in the year, and now we're about to hire another assessor. And it's going to be a little bit of a change because we're going from a full-time assessor to a part-time contracted assessor. So I've had to do my behind-the-scenes work to make sure I got the six votes that I need and the city needs to approve this assessor. So, 
and I communicated the resume, I communicated the um, I, a breakdown on how the city was going to save money by going to a part-time assessor. And um, Now whether that's right for every city, I don't know, but for Menominee it's the right thing to do. We didn't have enough work for a full-time assessor. And we're going to save about $25,000 a year and get a very good qualified assessor to do the work. So. That meeting will take place either tomorrow or Wednesday. Can you say that again? We um, lost our assessor about three months ago. And my analysis of the situation, the workload, everything, showed in, in the UP it's tough to find uh, good assessors. So. The analysis came out is we're better off with a part-time, 25 hours or so a week, assessor on a contracted basis. So what I did is I worked with our city clerk and we sent letters to every assessor in the UP who was registered as an assessor. We got three candidates. I interviewed three candidates, chose one, and passed it on to council for their approval since Technically, it's a department head and council has to approve, and they should approve. And I gave the resume, gave the background, and I've talked to all the councilmen uh, extolling the virtues of this individual, and hopefully we'll get a positive response. Any other follow-up questions? Ms. Member Smith. What's the most important role the council plays in the success of the community's future and what will you do to assure that we are successful in that task? Council plays a vital link in being um, the, more than the intermediary, but the intermediary between the residents and the city. I mean, you guys get calls all the time, I'm sure, about fixing this or fixing that or I have a problem here, I have a problem there and then you relate those concerns to me or to the building department or to the service department. Uh, so you're the first line of communication with the residents. They, they probably feel very comfortable in talking with all of you. And what was the second part to your question? Um, what will you do to assure that we're success effective in the task? Well, I've done this in the past and will continue to do, and that is to make sure that you're get, you, you receive an answer for every <coughs> thing you send to me. So if you say, I have a resident that has a report in a big pothole in the front of their street, I would refer that to the service department and once it's patched, send you an email or a memo saying uh, that uh, pothole is now patched. Or a resident is complaining about the condition of their street. Well, maybe we have to go out and take a look at it and talk to the resident. I know you can't fix streets right away, but at least report back to you that we, we spoke to the resident, we listened to their concerns, and here's where it stands. So I think the, the, the important thing is to get the requests from council and to give you an answer back so you're not left hanging with that resident or business or whatever the case may be. Do you find it best to provide your council with recommendations for action or merely options from which they choose? Well, I think you do both. You, 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 you give options. I would, here, I would give options to you, and then I would give you my recommendation. Now, whether you choose that recommendation is up to you, but I would, I would give you a recommendation. I think that's part of my job to say, here's the three options. I think this one is the best option, but here's reasons for all of them. Are you more of a manager or a leader, and can you describe how you exemplify the best of that quality? Probably more of a manager, uh, and I let my, my style would be that we have good department heads. In both cities that I've worked as mayor and city manager, we have good department heads, so I let the department heads manage their departments. I don't micromanage. I believe that if a person is hired for a good position, then, then they have qualities to do that job, so let them do their job. So 
uh, with the understanding that the city manager is above all the department heads and you report to the department heads or that you report to the city manager and there is somebody watching what you're doing, there is somebody working with you, there is somebody there to run ideas through, there's somebody there to work the budget with. So I, I would, you know, the, the, being a manager you also have to be a leader. So I mean those things you cannot separate either, but if you're going to ask me to choose one of the two, I think as a city manager you've got to be a manager. You've got to make sure that the buck stops with you and that uh, the people know, the department heads know their direction and, and what they're supposed to do, etc. So. Uh, when hiring a new department director to join your team, what skills and characteristics would they need to possess and why? Well, depending on which department, but I think I would say they need to have good manager skills for people. Uh, they're going to have people to manage or to oversee, so they got to be able to get along with their employees. they got to be able to listen to their employees and direct their employees. I think they have to have some good financial skills because nowadays a department head, a department manager has to run a budget, has to stay within a budget. Um, think reliability, you need to be reliable. Uh, you need to report to work every day and put in a good work day, so that goes along with reliability. Those those three things I'd look for. Any other questions? Have you had an opportunity to hire as a city manager or mayor? Oh yes, sure. I have hired several department heads. Um, in, in, as mayor of East Lake, we went through two building. Uh, it, it was a little different in Ohio. Our building manager had to have a plumbing license, um, electrical license, as well as the ability to review site plans. So you had to have special skills. And sometimes we were we were not small. We were eighteen thousand people. But some of the bigger suburbs and some of the other outlying suburbs in the, the Cleveland area would scoop up a trained building department person. So I went through two building officials, hired them. They lasted three, four years each, and they just moved on to other things. I'm trying to think. Um, well, in Menominee, of course, we're hiring an assessor. Um, the police chief and fire chief came up through the ranks. We, we changed police and fire chiefs in East Lake, but they came up through the ranks. Now, I didn't hire them, but I was involved in the hiring process where they were given a test and then rated, and one of the lieutenants became chief in each area. So, yes, I have hired. Okay. And in the private sector, I hired a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilmember Whitliff? Oh, I'm sorry. Is there another question? <laughs> Going back to your statement earlier, it's kind of bouncing in here. Your recommendations. Do you, you, what if I disagree with your recommendation? Do you go to the next council member try to sway them to because you feel strongly about that? No, 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 no. I, I, I sensed you sort of had some hesitation with me. Um, look, council ultimately makes the decision. I would provide council with options and recommendations and maybe maybe you want uh, perhaps you may want the city manager here not to make recommendations if you just say our direction to you mr city manager is give us the options and we'll choose the best alternative that's fine or if you say give us the options but let us know what you're leaning towards fine no i would not try to i would not tell you something and then you say no, and then go to have these other three gentlemen try to convince you otherwise. No. I would present the options to you, and council would decide what to do. That's what I've done. And I, I hope that, I, I sense, I, I'm trying to say what I said about the assessor. It, what you said was, when you finally got the six councils to support what I wanted, that's where you threw red flags all over. I'm not trying to attack you, sir, but that's what you said <coughs> I, that, that scares me. No, no. It, and I'm glad you you're 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 trying you're giving me a chance to clarify that here. In Menominee, 
we need to have six votes to approve a new hiring of a department head. So I've presented a candidate that has all the qualifications and has all the skills needed to do the job. And in order to do that, we need six votes. So I've just sent emails to all the councilmen with the qualifications, with the attributes of this individual and asked for their support. I haven't gone to each councilman and said, I need your vote. I, I don't want to give you that impression. Okay? And in the council, will council will ultimately decide that. And if they decide, no, we want you to go out and get a better candidate or a different candidate, I'll go out and get a better candidate. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, well, no, thank you for asking again because I saw there was something I said that bothered you, so right. I appreciate that. As long as we're back on the assessor issue, um, and again, we can talk about the media, and I understand media bias uh, and, and such. Uh, the local media that indicate that that assessor has already begun duties, or at least some city officials said that they were in the office working, uh, and it was prior to council approval of that position. That's not true? No, no, no. The, the person we're looking to hire lives two and a half hours away okay. and has a job as a part time or as an assistant assessor and building official. She has. What, what paper was that in? Uh, I, I, it was on the internet. Oh, uh, if it was one of those blogs, no, no. No, it wasn't a blog. It was a newspaper. So. No, there's only one. No, well, that's okay. I, I believe you, but no, absolutely not. You sure that was that just recent or was we, that months we have, ago? We have blogs here too. <laughs> <laughs> was was that recent or was that months ago? It was. It was recent. Like the last few days. No, no it's not true. Okay. No, we we have not even no. We don't have an assessor. That's why I'm looking for one. Any other questions? Councilmember Whitman. Welcome, Ted. The man of C. Uh, just a series of questions here. Um, first one: getting to a uh, getting to a collaborative agreement on contentious issues is always difficult. Uh, some municipalities face tough financial choices. Others struggle with uh, resident agreements, disagreements, excuse me, over the future or the plan for the future. Walk us through a time when you faced a particularly de decisive problem and tell us the process you used to get the parties to yes. Well, I, th I think the best example for me is back in East Lake when we had the $3 million general fund deficit and we had to come up with a recovery plan to give to the state of Ohio. And in that recovery plan were some tough decisions, uh, meaning layoffs of employees, um, cutting back on some purchase of equipment that was scheduled. Um, the collaborative agreement would be to present that, I think we present. I know I did, we presented the plan to all the department heads and asked for their concurrence that this was the thing we had to do. Uh, presented the plan to council who had the final say on whether the recovery plan would be adopted because the council had to adopt the recovery plan and then uh, give it to the state of Ohio. So the, the collaborative thing was, and, and I, I know when we did the recovery plan, I worked with our finance director, our service director, police and fire chief. Yeah, I'm trying to think who else. Most of the department heads were involved in the recovery plan because they all had input and they all had to cut from their departments. So we got the feedback from them and got their recommendations as to if I, because I think I, we went to them and I said, each department has to have 20% in cuts. So give us your recommendation as to what you will cut. We have no choice, we have to cut. So tell me where you want to cut. And that's that's a heck of a hole to fill, but how what was the time frame to, to get back to a positive balance? Two and a half years. Two and a half years, mm -hmm. okay. All right. mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, the next question, looking back over your career so far, uh, what do you see as the most creative or innovative project or program that you were involved with? Or involved with? Tell us about it, why you were involved in getting it done, and why you are, why, uh, excuse me, why you think it was a novel approach? Well, I did a lot with economic development and, and, and feel very comfortable doing economic development. In the city of Eastlake, we had a main shopping area, a big shopping area, retail area, 
and Kmart closed. Next to Kmart, a little ways over, was a smaller Walmart, not a Walmart superstore, just a Walmart. And in that particular plaza, there was a deed restriction that prevented the Walmart from becoming a super Walmart to sell groceries and fresh fruits and meats as long as there was a grocery store in that plaza. And that was how they were brought in and that was to protect the grocery store. Uh, the grocery store subsequently got up and left and the Kmart went out of business. They closed at Kmart. So what I did is I called well, I'll never forget, I called Walmart down in Arkansas and let the real estate people know that the Kmart building is privately owned. You can buy it. It's for sale. And if you move four or five hundred yards down the street, you'll get rid of that deed restriction. So you can open up a super Walmart without any deed restriction. And they did. So it took about two and a half to three years uh, and I received, the, first of all, I received a phone call. I remember the day when the real estate person from Walmart called and said, we bought the Kmart building. We're going to build a super Walmart in your city. And then two and a half, three years later, construction, we had a brand new super Walmart. So the creative thing was Walmart wanted to build a super center in our city. They knew the, the business was there, the traffic was there, but they couldn't build it where they were. And when the opportunity to buy the Kmart location came up, I called them right away and presented it to them, and it worked. Um, you, a couple of years back, we had an opportunity to get a Walmart south of town, by the township, and that did not go. Since then, we've had a Meyer uh, come to Manistee, and Manistee Township, um, and it, it's been a positive impact, I think, for the city and in the, in the, in the county. How did the Super Walmart affect East Lake? It was positive. Other than um, a little bit of traffic congestion, but it was a positive move because the grocery store moved out and there was no grocery store. So Walmart took the place of the grocery store. There weren't a lot of, um, there were not a lot of smaller family type businesses in East Lake because you, you hear the tales when Walmart or Meyer goes in that all the retail closes up around it because they scoop up all the business. That didn't happen in East Lake. Matter of fact, it, it spawned that plaza to get filled up with businesses that were vacant buildings before. And I, and I would ask some of the business owners, I said, don't you mind competing with Walmart? And they said, no, because our customers are very loyal, they'll come to us. And the fact that Walmart is drawing people into the city brings us the potential for more customers. So okay. that's the way you gotta look at it. Walmart and Meyer draw people into your community some of those people will shop in other, or eat, or buy gas, or do something in other areas of your city. Okay. That's what we're hoping to find out with, with Meyer yeah, I understand. and the redevelopment of our downtown. So I understand Meyer just opened. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Uh, the last question. Um, every Michigan community has faced uh, severe financial difficulties over the past, or over the last decade. When you, look, when you look at our budget and the forecast into the next couple of years, what do you see and what are you uh, bringing to the table that will help us manage uh, our financial challenges? Well, I know in working in the bu two budgets in Menominee that most of our money comes from real estate taxes. So somehow you've got to work with the community, in the community, to make sure that uh, people buy houses here. That adds to your real estate value businesses move into the vacant buildings and then take over those buildings and add to the real estate tax roll. And then the other thing you have to do is you just got to manage the budget. I mean, you got to know that you only have a certain dollar amount to spend and you got to stay within that budget as painful as it might be. I don't see um, in, in many Michigan cities the opportunity for a huge growth of revenue. It'll be a slow if any growth, so you've got to manage what you have and, and find ways to save money, you've got to find ways to get grants. Uh, it's just the reality is the revenues are not growing very fast, if at all. Any Thank follow you. Follow-up questions? Council Member Goodstein? A few more. Uh, tell us uh, a little bit about any intergovernmental or regional 
cooperation efforts you've championed in the past, and how did you measure their effectiveness? Well, we, we did a couple of things. First of all, on health insurance, because health insurance is, is one of those costs that continues to go up. So what we did is we worked all the suburbs of, it was Lake County, Ohio. We worked with the county, and the county was the lead entity, and we established a countywide um, insurance program. So the county bought the insurance and um, bought it from a private carrier when we did a stop loss. $100,000, the county would pay the bills, and after that we had co-insurance, and we would all buy into that plan. So it was a um, county-wide, and it took our 100 and some employees and put them into a group of five, 6,000 employees. So we were able to get better rates and we were able to spread our costs over a larger population. So that worked out very well. And the, and the rate increases were somewhere in the three to 4% range, very reasonable. Um, the other thing we tried, which we did not succeed in doing, is to try to create a fire district. Um, the thought in Lake County as to one of the things to reduce cost would be to take some of the smaller suburbs and instead of every suburb having their own fire department, that we create a fire district and that we have a western county, a central county, and an eastern county presence and that would be the fire district. That did not work. We had too much resistance to that. In Manistee, uh, the city manager functions also as the human resources director. What is the most important, long-lasting initiative you developed regarding employee growth and development? And tell me what measures are uh, used to judge that success of that effort. I probably don't have a good answer for that one. Um, we encourage training. So when a department head or an employee asks to go to training, as long training as long as it's, um, I see the as long as I can see the relationship to their job, then we send them to training. Um, department heads, police chief, fire chief, building guy go to a lot of training sessions in the Upper Peninsula. East Lake, I did the same thing. If people wanted to go to training, everybody had a budget for training. And as long as you stuck within that budget, and as long as it was job related, I encourage training. Um, I, I think that's the only answer I can give you, okay? The city manager is also responsible for negotiating contracts with our four different unions. Tell me about your experience with public unions and explain how you would approach negotiations to ensure a solid working relationship even after the agreement was uh, inked. Well, that's a good question, because that's one of my strengths. Um, in, I didn't do, the contracts for Menominee are coming up in 2016. Uh, in Eastlake, I negotiated three contracts. We had the police FOP, we had a sergeants and lieutenants union, uh, we had the AFSME, which is here Teamsters for the service department, um, we had the dispatchers union, we had five unions, five or six unions and the fire department, how can I forget the fire department, the uh, International Firefighters Association. I negotiated three contracts. Uh, some of the contracts were pretty bad as far as uh, for the city because the mayor I took over pretty much gave the unions everything they wanted because he wanted it and he wanted it for all his friends. So the thing was, and I'll give you, an exa I'll give you examples. In, in Eastlake, the mayor and his, his friends wanted, when they had their sick day payout, they wanted 100% payout. So for every sick day, they accumulated them throughout their career, and when they left, they got 100% payout for that. Now the standard is 25%. Uh, and the reason that was given to the union, the union said, great, we'll take it. You know, we'll take 100%. And it, it took me two contracts, but it's now down, to, it was when I left, down to 50%. And I remember the arbitrators, went, that issue went to arbitration. The arbitrator said, even at 50%, East Lake's payout policy is very lucrative. He used the word lucrative. So we sit down first, we, we each get our um, plans together. 
the city will draw up a plan and, and we'll sit, I'll sit down with our department heads and I'll sit down with our labor attorney. And we only employed the labor attorney when at the beginning and then if it went to arbitration or fact finding. Other than that, myself and the finance director handled it. So we come up with a plan to say, okay, we're going to ask for these 10 things, but we really want these three things. So we know going into the negotiations, these are the three things we want to change or we want to get taken out of the contract or whatever. So then you'd present that to the union, the union would give us theirs, and we'd have maybe five or six negotiating sessions, give and take, language, okay, we agree to this, you agree to this. And then it came down to usually two or three issues, pay, benefit, health insurance, and some sort of work rules. Uh, one of the more difficult ones I dealt with, uh, it was called minimum manning, where both the police and fire department had, because of the old mayor, put it into their contracts, minimum manning. That's a killer, uh, because it says that at all times there must be six or eight firemen, well, I think we had eight at one time, in the fire station at all times. So if someone called in sick, another fireman came in at overtime for 24 hours. A lot of money. And it had to be because the contract said you must have eight people there. And we didn't have any spares. So it, it, uh, the, then it went to fact finding, where a fact finder came in and we talked about the three issues. And usually one or two of those issues would be negotiated out. And then the uh, final thing would be if there were one or two issues left, it would go to binding arbitration. And in Ohio, it was where the city presented their final case, the union fin put their final case, and the arbitrator decided on one or the other. So, But we tried to get the major issues done before fact-finding and arbitration, but every contract, because our contracts were kind of one-sided, we, we, we went to arbitration. So I do have a lot of experience in contract negotiations. I think the, the best thing I saw was the best contracts we had, neither party was happy with, but you lived with it. Okay? You know, we griped about it, they griped about it, but we lived with it. And afterwards, I think the key is you don't dwell on it. If um, we were successful in getting that sick time down from 100% to 75 and then to 50, I didn't rub it in. I just let it go. Just let it go. It's part of the contract. Economic development and redevelopment can take many forms. Tell us about your experience in the field. More importantly, what is your philosophy and, and, and what approach uh, would you suggest for this community with regards to economic development? Well, I, I think I touched on it earlier. That when you get an inquiry into the city, you need to follow that through till it ends. Whether it's a yes or a no, you need to follow it. That means keep in contact with the company or the executives or the real estate people who inquired uh, to do the follow-up and then for smaller companies it's help them with the building permits, help them with the process to get it approved by the Planning Commission, uh, help them through the process so they don't feel like you're big bad government and I can't work with you, you know, make them feel relaxed. Um, I think you got to be very careful in giving away tax dollars because if you give away all the tax dollars for a lot of years there's no revenue coming in. I mean, you, you might want to look at doing it for five years uh, to have an incentive to bring companies in, but if you give it away for 30 years, it, it doesn't work. Because yes, you brought a company in, but you don't get any tax revenue for it, yet you're going to have to supply police and fire services, road work, uh, snow removal. So you got to really watch that you don't give away the store. Have you worked with uh, an economic development corporation within the communities that you served? Yes, we have. Um, the, the county has an MEDC. Um, we have a person that we each pay a little bit of money to, to be the economic development person for the entire county. So Menominee gets a piece of her, the county gets a piece of her, and the townships get a piece of her. And she's supposed to be working to bring business into the entire area. Okay. Now, a lot of the stuff that comes to the city, 
the, um, the expansion we did with anchor coupling, the expansion we did with a helicopter company called Enstrom, and one we did for Ellie Jones Company, all came through the city because we had to do some infrastructure work to get them to do the expansion. So they said, we will do an expansion if you put in a water line and you extend our road. So that you can do. Any questions? I have a couple. Um, going back to um, Councilmember Gudstad's question around the HR area, um, as a manager, what kind of aspects did you do as far as your employee development? Did you have any? I, I, again, you're going to find that I give honest answers, and there was not a whole. There is not a whole lot of. Employee development in Menominee were too small. Um, the best I can do is encourage people to do outside um, training and, and learning. Okay, now I just went to one Friday and I went with our treasurer uh, to a human resource conference that was in put on by the Upper Peninsula Human Resource Management Association. We learned a lot about new laws and changes in the laws and that, but. Um, as far as employee development, I mean, I would encourage it, but Menominee is too small. We didn't have a whole lot of money to put into employee development, so therefore we just had them do outside training. What about in your um, private sector? What kind of manager were you as far as employee development there? It, it was kind of the same thing, where, where we could sell, especially for salespeople. I mean, I would encourage and I would find courses for our salespeople to go to to develop their sales skills, to be develop their personal skills with customers. Uh, we did a lot of uh, customer service in-house training, uh, how to answer the phone call, how to be courteous to the customer. We did in-house seminars, but that was, I mean, that was AT&T and that was Sherwin-Williams. Those were big companies that had budgets for employee <coughs> development. Uh, what about uh, sit-down annual reviews with employees? Oh, well that, yeah, sure, I'm sorry, if that, if that was the, the question, yes. We have an employee review. Well, the department heads review with the employees, and then I review the department heads. And we have a form, a formal form that we use for evaluation. And I sit down with the department heads and we go over their evaluation for the year before the yearly raises are given out. And we go over what their strong points are, what things we need to work on, and then they give me feedback too. How am I doing? You know, we, we get along okay. Do you feel like you come in and talk to me? Uh, that sort of thing. So there's open communication during that review process. Yeah, I misunderstood. I didn't. We, we didn't have the money to do in-house training or anything like that. Okay. I'm glad you clarified that. Manistee is a smaller community uh, as far as the city goes than what Menominee is. I mean, we're a city of about 6,200 people for population. Yet our um, clerk's office has a succession plan where the deputy clerk is, is trained and, and functions uh, towards the future to replace the city clerk uh, upon retirement. And we kind of look at some things like that. Um, in, in public safety, uh, our training program um, uses police officers as certified firefighters to supplement the uh, fire department. And, and we have advanced life support trained uh, paramedics as, as opposed to the basic life support that we, we have in the past. Those things are expensive, uh, but the community during past surveys has, uh, has expressed 80 plus percent support for those delivery methods and, and, and for those services despite the cost. And, and I think when we look at developing things and human human resources, I, th I think that may be where the mayor is going is what you know what experience you would have with that. Well East East Lake were firemen paramedics. We supplied the paramedics and we were the first responders even you know, transporting to the hospital. So the firemen and the policemen got the most training dollars and went did the most training. We had a training officer in the fire department that we shared with the other community next to us. We shared the cost, but there was a full-time training officer that did both departments. Um, now that you bring that up, Menominee, the, uh, the policemen and firemen probably go to the most training. 
because they have life support training, they have equipment training on the new uh, uh, defibrillators we got, things like that. So that money for police and fire is well spent. I would agree with the community. Uh, the, the only thing I'd put on that is when you sit when we sit down and do a budget with police and fire and the police and fire chief, you agree on a training budget that's reasonable that the city agrees to and that the department head agrees to, and then they stick by it. So, thank you. What's your comfort level with technology? I put uh, above average, not an expert, but above average. I mean, for the last 10 years, I've worked with um, everything probably you do in your business world, uh, emails, uh, Excel, Word, Word Perfect. I mean, um, all, I'm fine. I'm above average. I, I, let's put it this way. I'm enough to be dangerous, okay? <laughs> I, I, I would tell you this sincerely. In me, you're going to get a person with a lot of experience and that I know a, a little bit about a lot of things. I, I have good experience in a lot of different areas. Maybe not an expert on all kinds of areas, but I, I, I know my way around and I've been around and I know a lot of things, okay? And if I don't have the answers, Mr. Councilman, I, I have enough skill to go out and find those answers. There are people out there who have those answers, so we gotta find them and work with them. And I just have one follow-up on back-end economic development. Uh, we have a DDA. Have you had experience working with DDAs? Yes. And how do you see their role? Their renewal is coming up, so I'm just wondering how do you see the DDA's role and how important they play into a community? Yeah, DDAs are very good as an advisory uh, board in, in advising the city on what needs to be done for the downtown area, things like uh, the, the look of the stores, the, the facades. We also have a DDA Menominee. It, we are now working on the TIF. The TIF will be finalized at the probably the November council meeting, and we've expanded the TIF to include. It, was, it only started out here. Now it goes to here, and all of that money is spent on the downtown, on uh, facades, sidewalks, uh, beautification projects. So I feel strongly that a DDA is important to the downtown area because that should be composed of people that have businesses in the, deep, the downtown area or at least have an interest in the downtown area. We developed in Menominee, um, we had an old historic um, theater uh, building that is now a first class 50 uh, some unit apartment building and we worked with the state of Michigan on getting a grant and getting some tax uh, incentives for there. And now we're working on the one next to it a smaller building that'll have about 15 or 20 units. It's right on the waterfront, just like here. Uh, Menominee's a water city, uh, boating, uh, marina, everything like that, so. DDA is very important. Thank you. Any other follow-up questions? Is the, uh, the DDA in Menominee, is there a director and, and, a, and a staff and stuff? There's a, no, no, it's all volunteer, but there is a DDA president and they meet once a month. I've attended several of their meetings. Very good group, but no, they, they don't have a staff. No one gets paid. Okay. Now we also have an MBDA. We have a Menominee Downtown Business Association. We have a DDA and we have a business association. And the business association is again comprised of all the business owners in the downtown area and even some next to it, and they do all the parades, they do all the Christmas, the Thanksgiving, the summer stuff. So we have two separate groups. Is that volunteer also? All volunteer, and they're all business owners in that area, downtown area, yeah. Any questions? Okay, now it's your turn. Do you have any questions for us? Well, I, I think the biggest question I have is, uh, what are you looking for in, this, in your next city manager? If I can ask them. Uh, looking for, in, in uh, my thought, economic development for the community, uh, both uh, retail, commercial, industrial, residential. I would think a resource manager. 
Uh, we have historic facilities in town. We've got the oldest operational fire department in the state of Michigan. I saw the building. Yeah. We've got the historic Ramsdale Theater. Um, we have other uh, historic buildings in the downtown area. Uh, even though they're expensive to maintain and for businesses coming in, they're expensive to get into and meet all the requirements uh, in, in, the, uh, in the historic district. Uh, I think in the past the city has not been good managers of businesses such as the Ramsdale, which uh, loses money and requires much subsidy every year. Our new municipal arena, which, which is still not back to a break even and, and requires subsidy. And it, it kind of takes away from your ability to put money into streets and in, in into, as, as you said, community services and, and roll some of those tax dollars back to the, the general public. And I think, you know, there's, there's been some public animosity uh, over that. There's, I mean, there's a need to maintain and, and restore those, but uh, a, a good resource manager, someone uh, that can, can sell the attributes of the city. And I think, as you said, without giving 30 years of taxes away to, uh, to do that, uh, short-term incentives, uh, something to draw people in uh, and, and to sell the assets of the city. And, and what, if I were to ask any of the council people who want to answer, what would you say the biggest challenges of Manette, I was going to say Menominee, Manistee are? Anybody? I would say the, the challenge is like most areas, it's the budget and trying to finance. And as Mayor Pro Tem Smith alluded to, we have a lot of historic buildings. Um, the Ramsdell is one in which community put their own $3 million of their own money into it, but the city maintains it at a cost to the city. And so there's a division as, is the city treasure, but should that be what the city is doing? So it's managing the assets that we have with the income that we, that okay. we have. Okay. Um, I would expect that, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, continuing services with depleted funds. Yeah. Minus is going down, keeping services up. Yeah, that's always a challenge, yeah. Anybody else? Huh? As far as a city manager, I'm looking for somebody who is quite knowledgeable about the position, about being a city manager, um, someone who listens, um, someone that also could be tough, is not going to be wishy-washy or be pushed, you know, pushed around by certain sectors, one that's got a tough skin that can take a lot of negative comments, but also, you know, we have a section of community that is very positive about where they live and who works for the city. Um, so just someone that can stand up to when there is negative comments and always see the city in a good light um, and help to move it forward to help with the economic development. Those are all good, very good. We, and I was joking with Jeff when he was taking me around, but in, in both cities I've been in, we. we affectionately called a group of people who come to every council meeting and sit in the front row. We call them the cave people. You probably have them here. He told me they citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> so, but they're nice and they just mean well. They're just, you know, they're sometimes a little bit negative. Um, I, I think what you'll find with me is a person who is not afraid to make a decision and stick with it. Uh, I have a good way of telling people no and not having them hate me. Because sometimes the city manager, I can't fix that water line that goes from your house to the street. That's your responsibility. Or, I'm sorry, we don't have the funds this year to do your street and repair it. So, I mean, there are times when you can't give everything to everybody and you gotta be able to tell them no. So, I can take criticism. Um, uh, I do like the community to like me and I hope they would if you decide to hire me. I, I feel very confident after they get to know me, they like me. Everywhere I've been, people like me, so <laughs> I don't know why I would change here. Any other questions that you want to have for us? When, what, what is your time frame to hire someone? Well, our interim city manager probably would have said like months ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I see you've been here since March or April. And, I, I was just curious as to if you set a time frame or not anything yet. Um, the time frame is when we find the right candidate and the, we want to fill that position. Um, but we want to make sure we choose the right person. For okay, that that's a fair answer. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
anything. And uh, last question, how would you think someone from the outside would fit in here? Someone who maybe didn't grow up here but has an open mind and uh, would look at things from a different perspective. I know I'm not a hometown grown person, but how would uh, council and the people here feel about that? That's kind of what I'm looking for, an outsider. No? So, okay. I, I think you'd be okay if, if you were chosen. I know. You yeah. figure mm -hmm. you make your way. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. See, the thing is, I don't. I'm looking for a complete, fresh. <clears throat> I think that'd probably be on the top of my list to show you that I have is that I have experience uh, in running a city and managing a city, but I have no preconceived notions about amnesty. So I would be able to take a fresh look at everything and, and see how the process is and see how the things work here and maybe give you some different perspective. I, you would find in me a person, too, that I, I want to address this with the council that will stick around for a while. I mean, this is probably going to be my last stop, if anywhere. And I don't want you to hold the fact that I may be a little older. Uh, I, I would tell you that I have a good eight years to work yet. I have a plan to work eight years because I'm helping my kids with their college money. I told you all of them. I didn't tell you all of them. But they have, all have loans, and I'm helping all of them. So uh, what I would offer you is someone who would stick around for a while. I wouldn't use this as a stepping stone to go to a bigger, better city because I'm done with that. I, I chose here because it's a smaller uh, community, somewhere where I could do something good at and leave a good mark. I'm looking for someone who paints a positive image of Manistee, who talks about the positive things. Cheerleader. And, and yes, mm -hmm. you have you have those that all talk about the negative side. I mean, you don't want to paint yourself as a dysfunctional city. You want to be a positive, progressive city. Sure, if you want to attract people to come here, whether it be tourists or businesses or people who live here, you can't have a negative uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned it by having an open mind. You know, somebody starting new, coming in, needs to have an open uh, mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would not have any preconceived notions because I don't know a lot about a bad estate. So. Um, I think, you know, the decisive, uh, that's been brought up, decisive, someone that takes ownership for their action, um, not someone that's defensive, but someone that can defend their position uh, and, and make a persuasive argument. Um, so we got seven people on council here. Um, in most instances, we have a consensus, but sometimes we don't. Uh, only takes four to, to make a vote go, and, and sometimes that's the way it goes. Um, so there are differences of opinion. Uh, you know, as far as an outsider, I, I was an outsider. I came here in 1994. Um, so uh, sometimes it takes a while to be accepted, but it depends on the position you come in at. So. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up in Buffalo. I spent 20 uh, some years growing up in Buffalo. I grew up in Ravenna, Ohio. Ravenna, Ohio, okay. So you know where East Lake is. Yep. Then. Mm -hmm. I've been not wanting to ask this question, but I need to, I've just got to ask you. Yeah, this. go ahead. You talk about nine members, seven who like you and two that don't. How do you deal with that? You know what? I've learned as a city, well, first of all, I learned as an elected official, I need to get 51% of the vote. <laughs> and no matter how I try, I'm never going to get 100% of the vote. So all I need is 51%. Now, I won my elections in the 58 to 60 range, so I know people like me. So I always look at the positive and say, okay, at Menominee, I need always five votes to survive here. As long as I have five votes, I'm fine. And if I get six or seven, that's even better. And, and I tell you honestly, the two that I'm referring to, and you, 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 if you call Menominee, there are several councilmen who know that I'm interviewing and who said, Ted, if we can help you, we'll help you. But they would tell you, those two individuals, no matter what I do, I'm not going to please them. It's just, it just ain't going to happen. That must be quite a strain, a daily strain, to try to work under those conditions. It is, but you work through it, because my job is city manager, so I say, okay, I have two difficult individuals, but the other seven are fine, and the people are fine. So. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good question. Yeah. Do you have anything else for us? the chance I'll do a good job for you. All right, well, I appreciate you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity.